Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to you, and thanks for coming out this evening. Um, who thinks they can define the word magic in a brief, short sentence? Magic is... Goes beyond the natural laws. Perfect. What else would you say? How do you know when you're seeing something magical? It is. Amazing. Pardon me? Amazing. Amazing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. What would your definition of magic be? Oh, something, special. something special. All right, those are all perfect. I take this little piece of wood and. How much would you say that weighs? <laughs> um, a pounds? Maybe, right? It's like a feather. Yeah. I can't, no matter how hard I try, I cannot get this to balance on the end of my finger. As soon as I remove my other finger, it just falls right off. Then I take this belt, which is fairly substantial, and um, I put that on, and now it, it's heavier, and now it balances on my finger. And I'll leave it up here. You can all try this at the end if you want and you don't believe it. Um, there aren't any engineers in the audience, are there? Oh. But may I do one thing? Yes. <laughs> well, you can put it on your finger. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. It's unbreakable. So, no, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do that because sometimes it will actually stay even if you push it down a little bit. Let me just, uh, get this, won't, this centered. Won't, this, Needs to be shaped a little bit more. That's good. Okay. No, you, you go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, anyway, to me, it is magical because it's heavier, and now it balances. And I'm going to leave this up here so you can try this after, okay? Because I see the look in your eyes. And we start with that because I, I think what we're going to do tonight is is learn a bit, a little bit about something magical. And um, hopefully, if I do a good job and Bessie comes through for you, you're going to leave here with a little more optimism, a little more enthusiasm, maybe a, a renewed sense of, I can do this, um, facing some of the challenges in your life, and, uh, and maybe a little more bounce in your step, too. I've got three or four uh, minutes of videos that we'll show, and then um, tell you a little bit about the book and Bessie's story. But lights, please. absolutely can for most of her waking hours. Bessie was four years old and I was 61 when we learned that she was gradually going blind. She appears to believe her relentless effort will pay off and the world will somehow light up again if she just opens those white, filmy eyes wide enough. This book is about our charming, brave, chocolate lab's two and a half year transition to sightlessness and her adjustment to a world of darkness. In the process, Bessie unwittingly became an expert mentor and teacher for the high wire act of going older with grace and optimism. Because of her, I've become more watchful, mindful, compassionate, and ingenious, bringing up new ways to make her life better. Hey girl. This is our story. These next few videos were all taken in the last year of Bessie's life. Yeah. Yeah. No play soccer today? All right, here we go. Go. Yeah. Yeah. 
still find it eventually. Next time you've got a really challenging task in front of you and you're thinking about giving up, remember this. Okay. <laughs> Ash, may we have the lights, please? <clears throat> this is the first page of the book. <clears throat> Starts out before we begin. <clears throat> Excuse me. When my wife Ashley and I visited a kennel in a rural New Hampshire town to select a chocolate Labrador puppy, we had some reservations. The parents of the litter were described as healthy purebred labs, but the mother was mysterious, aloof, and detached, not to mention that her hair was falling out. The father was out of the picture, apparently having disappeared like a deadbeat dad who had slipped out of town before the police arrived. Then the kennel's owner opened a small pen and eight adorable lab puppies poured out, slipping and sliding all over each other like fish from a net, all except one. The last pup peered out at us, inched her way into the sunlight, and parked herself softly on Ashley's feet. That's the day we fell in love with Bessie. She was just seven weeks old, and we already knew we had the perfect dog. This book begins four years later, when Bessie's perfection began rising to new levels. So if, you, if you're a dog owner, you know that seven weeks is a little bit too soon to let a pup leave the mom. That should have been a, a little bell ringing in our ears that maybe there's something wrong here. Uh, but that was the dog, and how could we not take her home, right? Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, we subsequently learned that of, the nine, of those nine puppies that poured out of the net, except best, four of them went blind. So this was uh, a place where they were overbreeding dogs. It's since out of business, which is a good thing. Um, but lucky us, we got Bessie in the process. This is the uh, same day. That gives you a sense of just how tiny she was. That's Bess at about maybe 10 weeks, two months maybe. And here she is at one year old, back in the same place where that first picture was taken. If you've ever owned a chocolate lab, this is the classic low IQ, big heart <laughs> face, right? I don't know much, but I know I love you, and that's what counts. This is Bessie at about two. Eyes are working beautifully, no hint of any blindness in her future. And this is Bess at about three and a half. It was shortly after this picture was taken that we got the diagnosis. And uh, I'm going to go there in the book. What I'm going to try to do tonight is um, take you through this transition from the original diagnosis through the fade to blindness and then um, a, a couple of excerpts from chapters about Bessie as a blind dog and what we learned. Uh, there are 31 chapters in the book. I'm going to read excerpts from about nine of them. Um, so I'll leave some mystery out there. This chapter is called Time Remaining. And the quote at the beginning, there's a quote at the beginning of each chapter, the afternoon knows what the morning never suspected. Robert Frost. Isn't that beautiful? Turning 61 was a wonderful surprise. 
Simple pleasures were magnified. I became a better listener. Judgments were forgotten and forgiven, and I talked less because there was really not much point. By 61, a person has experienced most of the personal and universal joys and heartaches life can serve up, either directly or with one degree of separation. By 61, you get it, or you should. There's a faint drumbeat in the room when a person passes 60. It's called TR, time remaining. You realize how quickly time passed between 40 and 60 and understand that by some esoteric law of physics, the next 20 years will be a blur. But even with all this life experience, I'm stunned when Ashley returns from a routine visit to the veterinarian with unsettling news. Our silly four-year-old Bessie is losing her sight. According to her doctor, this sweet dog will be blind in 12 months. She has something called progressive retinal atrophy, an inherited disease that causes a degeneration of the retinas and results in permanent blindness, and it's untreatable. The doctor speculates that she currently has about 85% of her vision in, in daylight and 50% when it's dark. On walks after sunset, she bumps into things, stumbles occasionally, and takes it slow. I had thought that was just Bessie's style, but now I know better. When the sun comes up, she's fearless and full speed. Yet with each morning walk, I look for a hint of fading glory. Almost subconsciously, I realize Bessie is my GPS for the coming years of advancing age. And that was the day of transition. All of a sudden, my perspective and my connection to Bessie changed. The first four years of her life, we were teaching her and training her how to be a good dog. And then all of a sudden, we switched roles. And she started teaching me and Ashley how to transition from being, I guess, older adults to being, from being middle-aged to being older. And I think it, it applies to any age. Um, there are transitions that catch you by surprise, and Bessie became my tutor for that. Uh, any questions about the progressive retinal atrophy? Okay. Ash did the research and found out that blind dogs have a tendency to become depressed. We hadn't seen any evidence of that in Bessie. I, frankly, I don't think that gene's in her DNA. I think it skipped her. But we decided that with her blindness developing slowly that we'd have some guests over for the weekend, like a sleepover to raise her spirits a little bit. So this chapter is called House Guests. And the quote at the beginning is, what a hell of a heaven it will be when they get all these hypocrites assembled there. Mark Twain said that. <laughs> Thank goodness for Mark Twain, right? Her two best canine friends happen to be Tula and Tui, the dogs owned by her sons. Both are female. Tula is a seasoned pit bull mutt from Brooklyn. Our older son, Tyler, rescued her as a puppy during his college days when the couple who owned her broke up and couldn't decide who would take the dog. Tula spent multiple hours a day chained to a post by a Fort Greene brownstone until our son adopted her. She has the Venus symbol for woman tattooed on her stomach. Tula was spayed as a puppy, and this must have been a message to all of her suitors from Flatbush. Save your ammo, boys. She wears it well. Once a cheerful sweetheart, Tula's a bit crotchety now at 11 years old, gray in the face but still beautifully sleek, like some aging Hollywood star who spends hours each day with a personal trainer and a nutritionist and is close friends with a cosmetic surgeon. You know, the type who looks great from a distance, but more like something from a wax museum up close. <laughs> Tula's a sweetie, but her demeanor can convey a strong sense of entitlement. Our other guest is Tui, a border collie named after a large honey-eating bird of New Zealand where she was born. Our younger son, Trevor, traded a quart of firewood for Tui and Wanaka on the South Island where he spent a year after college. She flew home with him to New York, and after almost two days of air travel in a crate, she walked out of baggage claim and pooped and peed in the terminal at JFK. I liked this dog right away. <laughs> Dewey's a genius, bred to herd sheep, hundreds of them, all by herself. If there were colleges for dogs, Dewey would get a scholarship to all the Ivies in Stanford. Simply stated, she loves all people and hates all other animals, except Bessie. That's because Bessie lets Dewey do anything to her, including dragging her around by the scruff of the neck. Sometimes I just have to turn away. Over the weekend, Ashley and I go for long walks with the dogs, wrestle with them, build snowmen, watch football games, take naps, you know, regular January things. And as the hours pass, I realize that Bessie, the youngest, is acting like the oldest. She thoughtfully relents to everything, like a lost breed of politician 
who knows how to compromise and get along with diverse groups. This trio of dog characters meshes like a three-part harmony because Bessie defers. I don't think it's insecurity or lack of confidence that makes Bessie behave this way. She's like a Buddha who's found enlightenment and simply wants others to be happy and content. Here she is at the age of four, losing her eyesight day by day. And these older fools are worrying about who sleeps where and who gets the cookies. Once again, this humble dog shines a bright light on our world from her increasingly dark one. Her message, wake up. 99% of the things we do each day are of little or no importance. The only things that really matter are those we do to make life a little better for others. I wish Bessie could look in a mirror and see how beautiful she is. That's not going to happen, but somehow I think she knows she's getting lovelier by the day. You can see it in her eyes. You all figured out who Tula and Tui are. Okay, good. Um, any questions? We're in January now. Next chapter is called Spring Training. And um, we're into April now. Made it through the winter. Um, the quote at the beginning, what day is it? It's today, Squeak Piglet. My favorite day, said Pooh. Right? I'm going to read it again. What day is it? It's today, Squeak Piglet. My favorite day, said Pooh. A.A. A. Milne, of course. To better understand Bessie's plight, I put on sunglasses one dark evening and walked through our backyard. It's frightening, really. The farther I get from familiar objects, the more I bump into things, the harder it is to negotiate my path. I throw a ball into the darkness and can't find it. The urge to remove the sunglasses is overpowering, and it affords me another chance to admire how stoically Bessie is coping. When Bessie comes to me with a ball in her mouth, I'm more likely now to drop what I'm doing and give her what she wants, my time. I recall feeling somewhat the same way with our children when they were young and asked me to play catch or go fishing. I knew the day would come when they'd outgrow their interest in being with dad, so I almost always said yes. With Bessie, it's different. Her ability will disappear before her interest fades, and I can only imagine how terribly confusing and heartbreaking that will be for her. So here I am again, always saying yes. I tend to see everyone in my life now as I see Bessie, that is, in the bright, shining light of the moment. The celebration of today is all I can be sure of. Bessie teaches me, be where you are. Any questions? At the boarding school where we worked for 42 years, and we lived on campus all those years, <clears throat> we had this great tradition in the fall before the first athletic contest. It's called the Blue Dog Parade because our mascot was a blue dog. So we would all dress our pets up in school colors. Bessie's got a, uh, an Elizabethan collar, but instead of re wearing it around her neck, which she had to do for about six weeks one time to keep her from licking a wound on her fanny, um, she's got it around her waist as a skirt. And she's got a school t-shirt on, and then we dress her up a little bit with a pink uh, scarf around her neck. Now she's, she's well on her way to being a blind dog here. <clears throat> this chapter's called Back in School, so we're now in the fall. Almost, almost a year later. And the quote at the beginning, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. Dr. Seuss. A few days after the parade with pleasant memories guiding her, Bessie follows a group of kids from the athletic fields about half a mile back to the main campus and eventually makes her way to the steps outside my office. She appears as if she's on vacation, has just landed at the airport and is waiting for her ride. Bessie spends about an hour sitting there picking up head scratches and hugs the way a street musician collects dollars and spare change from passersby for a well-played melody. I watch her from my office window for a while and smile at the grace she conveys, surveying a landscape she can't really see but understands. For Bessie, the beginning of every day is like the start of a brilliant sun-kissed morning after a heavy rainstorm when the world is scrubbed clean and filled with endless promise and freshness. She heads out that door each morning with boundless high hopes and great faith, no, blind faith, that this will be the best day of her life. If Bessie could talk, I'm pretty sure she'd simply say, be strong and spread joy. And that's a pretty good message from a dog whose world is getting darker every day. What do you notice about this picture? What kind of stands out? The hockey puck. Right, she's chewed the heck out of this thing. She bites it so hard. 
Um, yeah, the pupils have dilated completely. This is a bright sunny day on a white ice lake in January <clears throat> or February. And those pupils should be tiny little pinpricks. Instead, they've dilated completely to let as much light as possible in to get to those decaying retinas. And so Bessie's, I think she's about six here, six, maybe a little over six. <clears throat> and this chapter is called Annual Checkup. There are only two forces in the world, the sword and the spirit. In the long run, the sword will always be conquered by the spirit. Napoleon Bonaparte said that. Right, makes you shake your head a little. A year ago, we were told that Bessie's vision was about 85% in daylight and 50% in dim light. Now, she perceives about 50% of her world in the sun and more like 10% when it's dark. Now, I'm still playing retrieving games with Bessie, obviously. We still throw and bat and kick and hit balls for her. Um, and um, it's fascinating to watch her play, and we still do that now. Sometimes it takes her a few minutes to track down the ball, but she always finds it. The trouble now is that when she locates the ball and turns around with it in her mouth, she can't see me. The poor thing has found her trophy, but she's a retriever. Finding the prize is only half the process. She knows I'm out there somewhere, so her nose goes up like an antenna. I'm sorry, her nose goes up like a periscope, and her ears perk up like antenna, and she searches. There's a fearlessness in Bessie's spirit. She refuses to give up the game she loves, no matter how difficult or puzzling it becomes. A lot of instinct is at work here, but ample doses of courage, resilience, and defiance are also in play. Bessie and I are performing a delicate balancing act. At what point does this game become a mockery of a great dog's fading glory? At what point does it become more comical than productive, more cruel than pleasant? I take my cue from Bessie. Somehow this wonderful girl can still speak with her eyes. Based on my voice, she knows where to find me and returns the ball to my feet. She looks at me with a penetrating stare, a haunting stare. And though I know she cannot really see me, her message is clear. Don't you dare stop hitting balls for me, ever, no matter how hopeless I may seem. Bessie reminds me that we are defined more by our spirit and effort than by results. Any questions? Yes. Of course. I didn't do any research. I was just, this was a day-to-day -day transition, and I was just living it along with her, um, trying to pick up some of her wisdom, knowing that I would need it. I, I was keeping a diary. It wasn't a book at this time. I'll get to that in a few minutes. It was just a diary that I could go back and look at. Ashley was a little more of a researcher, trying to anticipate what might be happening. I was just watching and recording it uh, with, with admiration for the way Bess was handling it. I'm going to skip the title of this chapter because it gives away the punchline a little bit. Um, but the quote at the beginning is, joy, temperance, and repose. Slam the door on the doctor's nose. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said that. Most days I'm the first one downstairs in the morning. Sometimes I sneak around quietly like a commando, tiptoe to the mudroom where Bessie sleeps, and stealthily open the door. No matter how silent I try to be, Bessie is always on her feet, nose to the door, looking up with empty eyes that are somehow still filled with expectation. Her rapidly advancing blindness doesn't seem to be eroding her spirit or enthusiasm, and her positive energy is uplifting, like strong coffee on New Year's morning. She behaves as if she believes each day that her vision will return as soon as she steps into the backyard. Sadly, Bessie confirms her blindness each morning when she walks into something like a planter or porch furniture. But she deals with it as a mere inconvenience and heads enthusiastically into the day. Same is true when we let her out in the afternoon or evening. There is a level of energy in Bessie now that we have trouble understanding. She can't wait to get out into the apple orchard that grows beyond the perennial garden behind our house. My initial belief was that the open space of the orchard empowered a feeling of independence in Bessie, that she somehow remembered there was lots of open space back there 
among the scattered apple trees. I was wrong. Bessie is attracted to the orchard for the alcohol. This cagey, wily six-year-old lab has figured out somehow that the apples lying on the ground are filled with fermented apple cider. Like an alcoholic on the sly, Bessie slowly and casually saunters into the orchard and then devours the nectar-filled fruit. It may be my imagination, but I swear Bessie is catching a buzz before breakfast, and then again in the afternoon, and definitely before dinner. She is self-medicating her grief about going blind. I can't say I ever saw Bessie stagger or behave inappropriately, but she sure seemed happier and less concerned during the fall. Eventually the apples rotted and disappeared into the ground or under the snow, and Bessie got her drinking problem under control. She is selective in her choice of poison. I sometimes hold a glass of wine in her direction and she turns away. So I guess we only have to worry during apple season. What a piece of work this dog is. So this is Bess at about seven. And um, it was an interesting development. You know how if you're a dog owner, when your dog's out in the backyard, in the evening and you shine the flashlight, it glows, Those, the eyes glows, just have this iridescent reflection. Bessie's left eye stopped glowing. The right eye was still up a little bit um, if we shined the light just the right way, but the left eye was gone. And so this chapter is called Right-Eyed Bessie. And the quote at the beginning is, there are some people who see a great deal and some who see very little in the same things. Thomas Henry Huxley said that. I sometimes wish I'd filmed Bessie's transition to blindness. Her mannerisms are the same, pretty much unchanged, but her, bo her body remembers what to do, but the graceful girl is gone now, and she's awkward at times. She's like a ballet dancer who never had to think about her movements in relation to space, gradually becoming clumsy. In some ways, our six-and-a-half-year-old is in her prime. If you watch Bessie from a distance in an open field, you'll see a dog in full. The closer you get, the clearer her handicap. And when you get close enough to pat her, Bess will flinch at the touch just for an instant until she knows she's safe. And that's when you realize she can't see. And of course, those empty eyes that are turning white tell the story. I see and sense the world differently now. Moments of natural beauty are clearer, richer, more brilliant. Faces are portraits, each one a memorized masterpiece. Shadows are mysterious, fleeting, treasured images painted by the sun. I want to be sure that if the lights go out for me someday, I'll have a catalog of images in my memory bank, just as Bessie does. In the meantime, we will continue to sit in the sun together and feel the world around us. If Bessie senses I'm next to her, she'll nudge me to scratch her ears, ears that are as soft as the oldest t-shirt in your dresser. And she'll sigh just like she did when she could see clearly because with her eyes closed, she still can. This is Kate. Kate is a four-year-old close friend of Bessie's. And uh, Kate's dressed up like a veterinarian. Okay, she's got her stethoscope on and her doctor robe, her face mask, and she's checking Bessie's heart rate. I love this picture because if you look up in the top left corner, Bessie's winking at us, right? I think she is. She's saying, I know Kate's not a real veterinarian. But I'm going to let her go ahead with this anyway, because she's having a good time. I'll go along with it. I'm going to skip the title of this chapter, um, because it, it will kind of give things away. But the quote at the beginning was written by a young author named Nicole Ray. When Nicole Ray was 27 years old, she went blind, suddenly. It wasn't a gradual transition. And, and her quote is, when life's got you down, keep your head up. You can't see the ground anyway. Isn't that heroic? Wouldn't you like to meet her? So Ashley and I were pretty sure Bessie's lights had gone out, but we had no proof of it. Um, going to the doctor with Bessie at this point in her transition was like going with a rock star. The, the clerical staff, the doctors, and the nurses had all watched this blindness unfold over a fairly long period of time. And it wasn't inflicted with malice or ill intent. It was just, this is the way Bessie's life unfolded. And she just accepted it with her tail wagging and her ears up. And um, even the most cynical person has to admire that kind of stoicism. 
So she became the center of attention. Everyone would drop what they're doing and come out and gather around her. It was really kind of interesting. You know, you, you felt special <laughs> bringing your famous dog to the, to the vet. But we'd been wondering what the final test for blindness will be, what device the doctor might roll out to make a conclusive diagnosis. Ashley and I are pretty sure Bessie's lights had gone out for good, but there's nothing scientific about our analysis. It's just the sense we have. Expecting to see Bessie fit in some complicated high-tech device that allows us to peer into those two milky white holes on her sweet face, we are relieved to see the doctor walk in with a handful of cotton balls. Bessie must overhear us because her ears perk up. If there's a ball involved, she knows there's fun ahead. <laughs> Not in this case, though. How ironic that the ultimate test for determining Bessie's utter blindness involves an element of her favorite activity. The vet stands about five feet away and one by one tosses half a, dozen half a dozen cotton balls at her face from different angles. She doesn't blink or flinch, not at all. She accepts each one like a tough boxer on the ropes with his hands down, taking punches in the late rounds. The little pieces of fluff bounce off her nose, eyes, and forehead silently and painlessly. But in my mind, each one lands on the floor with a loud crash. The long, slow fade is over. What originally was supposed to take just 12 months has in fact stretched over two and a half years. The tears well up in our eyes as the finality of the journey sinks in, but there are no tears from Bessie. She's sitting on the examination table with her eyes wide open and ears at attention, sensing that someone is throwing mysterious things at her. She remembers that in the past there was a treat at the end of each doctor appointment, and her instincts tell her this visit is winding down. She's even drooling a bit in happy expectation of the cookies that are coming. When something winds down for Bess, that only means something else is winding up. When we get home, she jumps out of the car and begins dancing in circles when Ashley promises her a walk. And off they go with Bessie leading the way, guided by a memory burned into the joyful place in her brain where walks are stored. Yes, off they go across the baseball field onto a path in the woods that Bessie's been walking for seven years. No leash, just a keen sense of where to go based on experience and instinct wrapped up in scents and sounds that keep her on the trail. She is connected to Ashley by some invisible tether of trust. Heaven forbid Bessie stop for a minute doing the things she loves just because of a little complication. I watch her disappear on her walk, embarrassed that I ever complained about anything and vowing never to do it again, ever. I watch her disappear on her walk, <coughs> excuse me, embarrassed that I ever complained about anything and vowing never to do it again, ever. <coughs> Sorry. Anybody have, Bessie loves her holidays just like the rest of us. Any idea which one this is? She's dressed up in a costume. Halloween, very good. That was uh, uh, last year's costume. <coughs> this year, I think she was kind of tired of the gray old lady look, so she went with something a little, a little hipper and a little bit younger. She's got black hair now. Um, obviously, you know what this one is. Best loves a party, right? Maybe a little too much. This is the morning after. This one's coming up. We could stick 300 of these things on Bessie's face and she wouldn't flinch. She'd just say, go ahead, let me know when you're done. I mean, look at the one stuck right on the end of her nose. I, we could do anything. This is, uh, this is her Easter bonnet. That was taken in September. And Bess loves the idea of paddleboarding. We put her on and push her back and forth. And she just sits there and loves the glide. She has a blast. I also take her out on the paddleboard, but uh, I think this is her real favorite. This is the book, obviously. And um, a quick story about how this came about. I wrote this as a diary so that I could look back and get my life lessons um, from Bessie, and I wanted to make sure I didn't forget the things I was learning, so I, let, I kept these on my laptop. Uh, a former student was going through a real rough patch in his life, so I sent him one of the chapters, and um, 
he wrote back a day or so later, what is this? So I told him the story and he said, send me the rest of it, please. So I sent him all 176 pages. Uh, this is a boy who went to our school on financial aid. He came from a great family with little means. Um, he earned a scholarship, a uh, full financial aid package to um, Phillips Exeter out in the seacoast. From there he earned a scholarship to Cal Berkeley out in the west coast. Great schools, wonderful young man. Uh, and then he uh, came back to Boston and um, worked for City Year. It's a volunteer a group. You go in and work in the inner city schools for a year, kind of mentor the young people, inspire them, show them you can do it. Uh, I did, you can. And, um, and then he went to the Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern on a, on a financial aid package. And now he's managing money for people like Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. So he's in the major leagues in uh, wealth management business. So he said, this needs to be somewhere else other than on your laptop. Um, he said, we're going to make it into a book. And I said, I, I, I can't do that. And he said, I can. And so he financed it, and we're paying him back now. And he said, take your time. I'm in no hurry. Uh, I just, he just wanted to be sure that it got out there. So it's a great story of a student helping a teacher, kind of completing that wonderful circle. If there are any teachers here, are there? OK, good, great, great. We go to schools now with Bessie, and we have a blast with the kids. The program's different than this. We don't read as much, a lot more interaction. Um, but I don't know, you can probably pick Bess out. She's right here, right? They cannot get close enough. They want to touch her, get to know her. They've got all kinds of questions for us. Um, and so when we visit schools, we, we try to share three what I think are really important lessons that Bessie helps teach them. The one is, everybody in the room has insecurities and weaknesses. I point at the principal. I say, even Mrs. So-and-so. The kids are like, no way. That's impossible. I said, nope, even she or even he. Um, and I said, kids, don't, don't hide those. That's part of what makes you special, different, unique. That's part of your fuel. Let it be one of the things that, that empowers you, um, makes you stronger. The other thing we share with the kids is asking for help is a sign of strength. Accepting help is a sign of strength. The happiest, most successful people I know are really good at saying, hey, I need some help with this. Or they're also really good when someone says, do you need help? They say, yeah, yes, I do. Um, and we say, if you know someone who needs help and you can't provide it, Talk to your teacher or a parent. They'll know who can help your friend. And the last part, I'm going to go back to this picture, is the idea that they cannot get close enough or show any more interest than, than possible in Bessie. If I brought a blind person into the room, or a person in a wheelchair, or someone with an uh, intellectual disability, they'd sit on their hands. They would not know what to say or do. They'd be completely awkward. And so we, our last message for the kids is respond to people with physical or intellectual disabilities or handicaps the same way you do with Bessie. Show your genuine interest, offer assistance, and show affection. And I, I, we tell them, if you do, you're going to find a heaven on earth that you didn't know. It's all around you, but you didn't know it was there. Um, and that's a really important thing for all of us but especially for kids, um, to be curious about people like that and talk with them, not to be intimidated. I, we think our message is getting through. This is, uh, we get postcards and, and letters from kids when we visit a school. This came from a fifth grader at the Vilas School in Alstead, New Hampshire. She sent it about a week after we'd been there with a little note. And uh, that was her interpretation of, of the book, <laughs> Bessie's story, watching the lights go out. Um, we have uh, an affiliation with needs.org. We've connected with them, and they've sponsored, not sponsored, but they've sanctioned our book because we donate a portion of the proceeds um, from the book to needs. It's a world-class service uh, dog training organization in Princeton, Mass. I mean, this is, these are major league service uh, training dogs. They, they work with wounded vets, blind people, people with autism, um, folks with real special needs. And so they put a pup in the program and named her Bessie. Aww. Bessie's legacy. She flunked out. 
<laughs> After a year. She was close, but they have such a high bar in this program that there's one little thing Bessie couldn't do, I guess. We don't know what it was. Um, so they said, do you want her? And we said, yeah. <laughs> and they said, one thing, you can't change your name. So we would have a 10-year-old, 10 and a half year old Bessie and a one-year-old Bessie. And we said, nah, I don't think so. I mean, can you imagine that? When you call, Bess, come here. So because they believe so strongly in the message of Bessie, this is Bessie too. She just started a couple weeks ago. Um, and we're pinning all our hopes on her. <laughs> we're hoping. This is Bessie at three, before we knew she was going blind. And this is Bessie at 10. What do you see in those, what does that picture, what strikes you about it? Yeah, it, camera angle is a little different, but um, she seems a little thinner. But uh, this picture to me is, if I had only one picture in the slideshow, this would be it. Her eyes are open wider when she's blind. Think about it. I mean, say that to yourself. Your, her eyes are open wider when she's blind. If you can't see something, open your eyes wider. If you can't understand something, open your mind a little wider. If you can't accept somebody, open your heart a little wider. I just think that that tells you all you need to know about Bessie. So this chapter is called a retriever forever. And the quote at the beginning is, being fearless isn't being 100% not fearful. It's being terrified, but you jump anyway. Taylor Swift said that. I will never believe that Taylor Swift is terrified <laughs> before she goes on stage. But apparently, she jumps anyway. So if you look closely at Bess a little later on, you might notice that uh, I think it's the lower left side. This bottom canine is chipped in half. Um, on any given day, you're apt to see little nicks around her nose or her eyes, um, tiny wounds. These are her trophies. This is her way of saying, you know, I, I'm still retrieving, and I'm willing to accept this. Um, one time she took off full speed after a toss ball, but in the wrong direction. I could not, before I could stop her, she ran straight into a tree. Momentarily stunned with blood dripping out of both nostrils, Bessie would not be consoled. She squirmed away from my sympathetic embrace and took off with her bleeding nose to the ground, eventually finding the ball, retrieving it, and dropping it at my feet. And as she stood there with her tail wagging, her watering blind eyes wide open and her body trembling with expectation, I had no option but to throw the ball again, which I did and which I will continue to do every day until my arm falls off or Bessie dies. She would never forgive me otherwise. Bessie ref refuses to back off. I sometimes wonder if she's stubborn, courageous, or just living blissfully in denial. But upon further reflection, who cares? She's full of joy, endlessly living in anticipation of the next adventure, and willing to get banged around a little bit in the process. What would the alternative be? Living her life on a leash or tied to a chain so as not to bloody her nose or chip a tooth now and then? Bessie would never forgive me for choosing the safe route cheating her out of a full life through my own caution. No thanks, not for Bessie, not for me. Chipped teeth, bloody noses, and a few scars are nothing compared to the unmet potential of a life spent looking out the window as a safe spectator. I'll take Bessie's example as a model for how to live. By the way, since there's so many teachers here, one of the things that we tell the kids when we're at school, um, or I tell them, I said, I was an average student. Um, my mind was on what I was going to do when the bell rang, and I was set free. Um, and then in seventh and eighth grade, I had two English teachers, Mrs. Fitzmorris and Mrs. Hickey. Fitz and Hicks, never to their face, of course. Um, and, and they impressed upon me that I could paint any picture I wanted with words. And that was a wonderful thing for a young kid to pick up. I wasn't ever any good with a paintbrush or a pencil, but all of a sudden it was like, I can paint any picture I want in someone's mind if I choose my words carefully. That put the fun in it. 
and I'd save my English until I was done with everything else and then really sink my teeth into it. I can't thank Fitz and Hicks now. They've passed away. So we tell the kids when they're at school, thank you teachers. Finish the sentence. Don't say thank you. Say thank you for and make sure you clearly state what it is you're thanking your teachers for. Um, and, and I know the faculty members at schools really appreciate that because we've heard that some of the kids are buying into it and, and taking the time to go thank their teachers for a very specific things. So another message. Um, I want you to do something a little silly now. I've got one more chapter to read. Um, <clears throat> I heard some of you talking to Bessie earlier in your best dog voices. We've all got them. We keep them right back here and we pull them up in a second, right? As soon as the dog enters the picture. I want you to talk to each other for 15 seconds or so in your dog voices. <laughs> Go ahead. Enjoy it. Oh, oh, there we go. Some hostility there. All right. Okay, good job. I only heard one sit down. I'm not even going to tell you where it came from. But um, you understand the concept of talking to dogs. The, the quote of this, of this chapter is, it's no coincidence that man's best friend cannot talk. Sometimes when watching particularly gruff, arrogant, or aggressive people in action, I wonder to myself what their dog voices sound like. What is President Donald Trump's dog voice? Or LeBron James or Megyn Kelly's? How about Hillary Clinton's dog voice? Maybe along with releasing tax returns, candidates for elected office should submit secretly recorded copies of their dog voices as a qualification. It might be interesting. Um, how about these democratic debates when there's 13, 14 people lined up on the stage? I, I would love it if the moderator said, the next segment is we're going to play 20 seconds of each candidate's secretly recorded dog voice. <laughs> if they did it at the beginning of the debate, we could turn the TV off, right? I'd know who I was voting for based on that, or not voting for. I'd know who was faking it. I'd know who had a real one. There are a number of dog voices I use with Bessie. One of them is the be careful voice when it's necessary to alert her that the terrain is changing or that something's in her path. Then there's the end of the day snuggle voice, which is most private of all. I would pay a healthy ransom to prevent a recording of me talking to Bessie in this context from ever becoming public. Our dear friends Kevin and Diane sometimes watch Bessie for us when we travel. Bessie absolutely loves these people, partly because they have such wonderful dog voices. When Bessie hears Diane's velvety voice ask, are you coming to stay with Auntie? She is overcome with joy and abandons us without looking back. Kevin lets Bessie help him with the yard work. A neighbor listening to Kevin's ongoing dialogue was shocked to discover he was talking to a dog rather than a person. Kevin's intellect and sense of humor are sharp as a knife's edge, and Bessie seems to enjoy the enlightening aspects of his conversations with her, especially when blended with Diane's affectionate voice, which Bessie laps up like warm butter. We all need to be more in touch with our dog voices. When interviewing teaching candidates, I used to pay particular attention if a dog wandered into the picture, listening closely to the tone and melody of the candidate's dog voice. It provided an unfiltered look into the most empathetic and nurturing aspects of the person's soul. Marriage proposals should be delayed until thoroughly vetting a future spouse's dog voice. <laughs> Same goes for college admission, getting a driver's license, or agreeing to sit next to someone on a long airplane flight. Just think how much less pretentious we would all be if our dog voices were part of our profiles. A final thought, what's it like when someone speaks to you in their dog voice? And now you know, right? Feels good, doesn't it? How about a dinner party? All you can do is use your dog voice, right? How long could adults keep it up? We did this at a school, with, and it was an audience of 300 kids. Took us 10 minutes to quiet them down. When we said, stop talking in your dog voice, please. Nope, they were having so much fun with it. So they really bought into that. 
We've put a lot of information in the funnel tonight. Um, by funnel, I mean here's this wide opening. And we started with the magic trick. And, um, and then we had the videos. And I took you through the Betsy's, transi Betsy's transition from a full sight regular dog to a blind dog. And um, think of that as all stuff in the funnel that's swirling down, swirling down, swirling down. Um, that's too much to remember. So I'm going to bring it to one drop at the end. And this is what I want you to walk out with tonight. It's the message that I hope you'll carry. It's the message of this book. And, and if I've done my job and Bessie's been a good teacher, you'll all have, I think, a, a little more joy in your life and a little more resilience and a little more optimism and maybe perseverance when you walk out that door. But this, this paragraph, to me, is, um, is the essence of the book. And... Um, it's, it's really, it's the takeaway that I hope each of, you, each of you leaves with. Bessie unknowingly floods me with daily reminders that each of us alone is in charge of our spirit and outlook. We can think of ourselves as poor, weak victims of unlucky turns or the happy celebrants and survivors of life's endless challenges and tests. Our girl is my hero, plain and simple. I've been inspired by her enormous strength and embarrassed by my comparative lame weakness. So here's your, here's your real simple message. Be like Bessie. Um, we share that with, with the kids at school. And um, we've heard some, from some teachers that it's been a good punchline for them when they're talking to kids or trying to drive a message home. And finally, they'll say, just be like Bessie. And the kids will go, I got that. OK. I can understand that. Be like Bessie. Um, so she's going to perform a little bit. Um, remember the, the video where she snapped the cookie off her nose? All right, this is not her normal size, so I'm hoping it works best. She's going to bump into a few things on the way up here, but she'll figure it out. Come here, Bess. Hey, girl. Come on. Nice job. All right. Come here. Come here. Okay. Sit. Stay. Up. Stay. Let's put it this way. Come here. Over here. Stay. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah, this size is throwing a stay. You can do this. Okay. One more time. Yeah, let's try this. Stay. Okay. Here you go. I'm going to try with one more piece and then sit. Sit. Come here. Come over here. Sit. Here we go. You got this, Bess. Ready? Over here. Come here. Stay. Okay. All right. Good girl. Sorry. <laughs> Does anybody have a question or a comment? Yes. I have a question. She has a very loud bell. Yeah. It makes me wonder whether that has something to do with the music hearing. Um, we still let her out, and she wanders a little bit. And um, so when, when we take our eye off her and we can't find her, we just listen for her bell, and that tells us where she is. But she'll, she'll walk into the woods and explore, just like a normal dog. So that bell. She also had an encounter with a coyote when she was a puppy. And so we put the bell on to kind of scare whatever was around away. Mm -hmm. um, very observant. Yes? Did, um, when you were working with one, one she lost her sight, did you ever like add scent to any of her, the toys you were playing? Best with Just her own scent. Or? Just her own scent. Yep. But when you call her, she'll come and she finds your voice. But do you think she also finds your scent? Like I think her, her sense of smell and her sense of hearing are far more acute now um, than they were. Yeah. Now she's... Uh, 
if we dropped a peanut in the back of this room, she'd hear it and find it. Eventually, she'd find it. She's 10 and a half. She's been blind for about three and a half years. Um, she smells cookies in my, her, my Yeah, pocket. I'm it, sure. Is she allowed to have anything? Or Are they cookies? Cookies no, or dog? Not. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to tell you a quick story, and I know you probably got to go. Um, I just, this is inspiring, the people we've met. We were at a uh, um, retirement community in New London, Connecticut. I mean, in New London, New Hampshire. And there was this guy named Pete who had the most beautiful blue eyes. And at the end of a session like this, there were about 20 people. She had, Bessie was resting her uh, chin on Pete's lap. And um, I looked over and said, Pete, what is it about you? There's 20 people here, and Bessie picked you out. He said, oh, I'm blind. And I was like, wow. And then I said, hey, Pete, you bought a book. And he said, yeah, I, my 92-year-old girlfriend's going to read it to me in bed tonight. <laughs> oh, my God. So he should be in the book. Yes. Pete should be in the book. But to find someone else. Yeah, Bessie just kind of figured out that he was the one in the crowd. And wow. Well, yes. Great question. Um, at first, she's really anxious. She doesn't know if she's nose to nose with a, a chihuahua or a, a full-grown German shepherd. She also can't read the body language of the other animal. So she's apt to snarf once or twice really loud to kind of say, don't, don't think you can take advantage of me just because I'm blind. Um, and then she gets in with the dog, and they're fine. Um, Liz Green's dog, um, Boomer, and Bessie sleep touching each other now. And there was a time when Bess had to put Boomer in his place. So she, if you give her enough time, she finds her peace. And, mm -hmm. But she used to be the absolute opposite of an alpha dog. As soon as another animal came, on her back, <laughs> you're the boss. Now she's a little bit more um, uh, aggressive, or maybe a little more cautious. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, we all get a little more cantankerous <laughs> when we're older. She knows more. Yeah. Put those um, life lessons up. Sure. Yeah. Do you mind if I? No, not at all. If you want, I'll send them to you. There we go. Well, we've got books for sale. Um, $17 for the paperbacks and $22 for the hardcovers. I do take credit cards. Um, I, I, this is just a fair warning. The first time I sold a book with this little square device on my cell phone, it was a hardcover for $22, and I sold it for $2,200. <laughs> right, me and technology. I hit. So I will show you the screen if you buy one, the credit card. I'll show you the screen before I... Uh, swipe the card. I got, it was a friend, and she called later that night and said, you know, it's a really good book, but I said, I only have to sell 10 of them. <laughs> well, you've been a great audience. I've had a lot of fun with you. Thanks for uh, giving up your evening. And I think we have some chocolate chip cookies left over. <laughs> She'd go home with you. <laughs> Never look back.